but you sense something special and, and I think the way that we've been um, received, the World Eleven team has been received in the ground and on social media and, and by all the cricket loving nation has, has been superb. In Major League Baseball, the Cleveland Indians have equaled the longest winning streak in American League history. Cleveland beat the Detroit Tigers 2-0 on Tuesday for their 20th straight victory. They can make it 21 in a row later on Wednesday. That would see them level the MLB's all-time winning streak held by the 1935 Chicago Cubs. And that's all you spot for me. I hand you back to Adrian. Salam, many thanks indeed. Now, there's something of a standoff developing in the U.S. over driverless vehicles. Congress and the Trump administration want to get more of the cars onto the road quickly, but a federal safety agency is warning that more regulation is needed before that can happen. Diane Estabrook reports. U.S. Transportation Secretary Elaine Cho released voluntary guidelines on driverless vehicles that give auto companies more flexibility in developing them. Our goal at the Department of Transportation is to help usher in this new era of transportation, innovation, and safety, ensuring that our country remains a global leader in autonomous technology. The new guidelines are scaled back from the ones the Obama administration announced last year. They're also at odds with recommendations the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration rolled out on the same day. It wants a more active role in regulating driverless vehicles by making car companies install more safeguards. The agency made the recommendation after finding that an inattentive driver's over-reliance on an automated system contributed to a fatal crash last year. Self-driving cars are an evolving technology, and manufacturers are racing to mass-produce them. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this bill, H.R. 3388, the Self-Drive Act. Last week, the House of Representatives passed legislation that could get them on highways more quickly by blocking individual states' regulations. Automakers, including Ford and General Motors, are applauding that legislation and the new Transportation Department guidelines. But consumer groups are urging caution, hoping regulators can provide a safe roadmap before they roll out of dealerships. Diane Estabrook, Al Jazeera. Still don't know whether I want to take a ride in one yet. That's it from me for the moment. Uh, I'll be back, though, in just a couple of days with all the latest, a uh, couple of days in a minute, with all the latest on the top story. See you then. Let's talk about now. Right now. Right now is happening so fast, you can barely keep up with it. Right now, we've got clouds protecting rhinos and mobile technology finding clean water. Not tomorrow, not five years in the future. Now. In a disaster, the internet can be restored by a truck. In a mine, this truck can drive itself. And right now, this child is being treated by a doctor from 6,000 miles away. This is science, not fiction. And Cisco networks are making it happen, now. Because when everything is securely connected, anything is possible. And there's never been a better time to change the world. Documentaries that open your eyes. At this time on Al Jazeera. How desperate for power are you that you've effectively done a deal with the devil? Frank. Does your language help bring Venezuela to table, yes or no? Yes, it does. Blunt. Israel is so strong, what can we do? This is too hard, let's go find a unicorn. Equal rights before the law, regardless of one's religion, should never be presented as a unicorn. And up front. I'm asking you about Iran. You're Iran. very cleverly deflected away from it. With Mahdi Hassan at this time on Al Jazeera. Do you see the double standard?
Myanmar's leader decides not to attend the UN General Assembly as she comes under fierce criticism over the handling of the Rohingya crisis. Hello again, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Al Jazeera live from Doha, also coming up. The president... Now is the time to build a more united, a stronger, a more democratic Europe for 2025. The president of the EU Commission lays out his vision for the bloc, urging countries to take advantage of Brexit and the economic upswing. Plus... Tension over the Gulf crisis spills over at a meeting at the Arab League in Cairo. And we meet the Nigerians whose lives have been blighted by Boko Haram violence but are determined to move forward. Myanmar's leader Aung San Suu Kyi will not attend this year's UN General Assembly meeting. She's been widely criticised around the world since violence against Muslim Rohingya in Rakhine State escalated last month. Since then, more than 370,000 people have crossed into Bangladesh to escape the conflict. But as Florence Louis reports now, many in Myanmar have rallied behind the government and the military. The sign reads, Collecting Donations for the Displaced in Rakhine State. This charity drive is being run by a monastery in Yangon, 600 kilometers from the fighting in northern Rakhine state. But it's mainly for the Rakhine, the ethnic majority in the state, who are mostly Buddhists, some 30,000 of whom have been displaced. If there was fighting here, a monk who runs into a mosque would be killed. But a monastery will save all who shelter there. Our religion forbids us from killing. But I'm not afraid to walk past a monastery, a church, or a Hindu or Sikh temple. But I'm scared of walking past a mosque. There are few in Myanmar who will speak out publicly in support of the Rohingya. The Muslim minority remain stateless and are largely regarded as illegal migrants from Bangladesh. The military crackdown, which has been condemned for its brutality around the world, hasn't drawn the same sort of criticism from people here. Yes, they should carry out a security operation to eradicate terrorism. If not, there'll be no peace. So that's why we support the military. But the operation should only target terrorists, not the whole Muslim community. I support the military operation because terrorism is not good. It's good to fight terrorism. Everyone should live within the law. The military and the government say the operation is a legitimate exercise targeting what it considers a terrorist organization. The crisis in Rakhine and the exodus of Rohingya refugees into Bangladesh are being widely covered by the international media. And yet here, they don't get much attention in the local press. And when they do, there's usually a government spin. This article, for example, promotes a press release that people in northern Rakhine have started to go back home because peace and stability have started to return to the area. But there's no mention of the hundreds of thousands who fled to Bangladesh in under three weeks, who now face an uncertain future and a daily struggle for survival. Florence Liu, Al Jazeera, Yangon. The wind is back in Europe's sails. That was the message from EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker in his annual State of the Union address. He told the European Parliament that there was now a window of opportunity to build a more united union after a bruising couple of years. He urged the bloc to move beyond Brexit and to forge new trade deals. And he called for a stronger migrant policy to ensure that those who don't warrant refugee protection are sent back. Juncker also criticised Turkey for arresting journalists and accusing EU leaders of being fascists. But the European Union... In future, the European Union will have more than 27 members. In the case of all accession countries, the rule of law, justice and fundamental values have a top priority in the negotiations, and that rules out EU membership for Turkey in the foreseeable future. For some considerable time, Turkey has been moving away from the European Union in leaps and bounds. Journalists belong in editorial offices amidst the heated debate and not in prison. Analysis now from Al Jazeera's Paul Brennan in Paris. A wide-ranging speech from the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. It's his annual State of the EU speech 
and you would expect, as he said, that Europe to admit that Europe had been battered and bruised a year ago. But he gave a very optimistic version of how he sees the outlook for Europe. He said that uh, unemployment, for example, is now at a nine-year low, that Europe had seen five successive years of economic growth and that eight million new jobs had been created during the time that he has been the president of the European Commission. As far as the outlook goes, he said there were many proposals that he would like to see to streamline decision-making, to have, for example, qualified majority voting on foreign policy issues, and also to see that the, uh, the way that the European Union uh, allows infrastructure to be owned should also be examined uh, as kind of investment screening. Um, he was at pains to say that Brexit will be a matter of regret for Europe, but he said it would probably be a bigger regret for the Brits, in his estimation. And the way that the EU plans to go forward after 2019, when Britain formally leaves, is to get even stronger. He wants a summit in Romania basically on the day that Britain leaves with the intention that the 27 should draw closer together. On migration, he said that there was no desire to turn Europe into a kind of fortress. There had been 720,000 successful asylum applications, he said, uh, to Europe in the last couple of years. And although the number of irregular migrants had dropped from a million back in 2015 to less than 130,000 uh, this year, he said that those who deserved asylum and were fleeing genuinely war uh, should be granted safety. Uh, that said, there were concerns about the number of those who do not qualify for asylum, how many of those were actually being sent back to their country. At the moment, it's around 36%, and he wants to see a big improvement in the numbers of those who fail in their asylum applications being put out of Europe, sent, sent back to where they came from. An explosion outside a stadium in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, has killed at least three people and injured several others. A cricket tournament was underway. When the blast went off, police say the explosion was caused by a suicide bomber. It's been 100 days since four Arab states cut ties with Qatar, sparking the worst diplomatic crisis to hit the region in decades. An Arab League meeting in Cairo descended into a shouting match as ministers from Qatar, the four states blockading the Gulf nation, traded insults. <laughs> a Qatari diplomat raised the boycott in his opening speech, even though it wasn't on the agenda. That led to a fiery exchange among the group, with Saudi Arabia and Qatar's representative telling each other to be quiet. The Emirati minister forgot to mention that in 1996, his country, together with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, wanted to invade Qatar and overthrow the regime. The tone used by Saudi Arabia's ambassador is threatening one, and I don't think he can back up his threats. Oh no, I'm up to backing them up. No, no, you are not. When I speak, you be quiet. No, you be quiet. Mr. President, allowing the Qatari delegate to speak will force us to respond to what he has to say. Opening the floor to Qatar again will mean the poor countries will respond. And if you want to stay here until the morning, I don't mind. The blockading countries accused Qatar of sponsoring terrorism, a charge that Doha strongly denies. The crisis has had a big impact on young people who've been studying in universities across the Gulf. One Qatari student we spoke to was just a way away, a day away rather, from finishing his degree when the Gulf crisis began. Caroline Malone reports from Doha. Ibrahim Yusuf Al Sada is on a mission to save his education. He studied for a bachelor's, then a master's degree in law for more than six years at Sharjah University in the UAE. He had an interview booked for his thesis on June 6th, a day after the Gulf crisis began, and all Qataris were ordered out of Bahrain, Egypt, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. I don't have any trust about the UAE or any country because, you know, when, when you study there more than six years, then that's happening. So should be uh, think about that. Yani, I think should be studying in Qatar better than any country. Al Sada can't get the certificates he needs from the UAE to prove he's finished his studies. He's enrolled at Qatar University in the hope that he'll still qualify. However, assessing new students without academic records is difficult. The total number is so far um, more than 33 students in the four countries: mm -hmm. Egypt, UAE. 
Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Um, the dilemma is the equivalency to make the course that the student already finished in the one of these countries equivalent, to make it equivalent to the one in Qatar University. You must compare the topics, uh, the content. Qatar's Human Rights Committee says they've heard from thousands of students who say their education has been disrupted by the crisis. At least 700 Bahrainis, Emiratis and Saudis have had to leave Qatar University when they were ordered to return home by their governments. That scar, that impact that it will be in the mindset of the new generation that it's certainly been part of that blockade, regardless of which part you've been in and which country you are at. And this is something that it is not easily been going to be you know, erased when the political decision of, you know, of those blockade country will change. Universities have reopened after the summer holidays and just like last year will include students from all over the region and other parts of the world. Students are registering here for the new academic year at Qatar University. Among them are students from the blockading countries who decided to stay on or register despite the restrictions. And there are Qataris who've been kicked out of other regional institutions and have had to come back home to Doha to continue their degrees. Students such as Al Sada, who's grateful for the opportunity to secure an education despite the political arguments. Caroline Malone, Al Jazeera, Doha. Saudi Arabia is rejecting calls for an international investigation into allegations of human rights violations in Yemen. The country's ambassador to the UN Human Rights Council says the time is not right for an inquiry and that he's hoping for a compromise. The Netherlands and Canada are backing a resolution calling for an inquiry. The council says it had verified over 5,000 civilian deaths in the war, mainly due to airstrikes by the Saudi-led coalition. Members of the European Parliament have voted for an EU-wide arms embargo against Saudi Arabia, but the vote is a symbolic one. The EU has no power to implement a ban on arms sales, but individual states do. The vote was used to send a political message to the Saudis over their bombing campaign in Yemen. We'll get a weather update next here on Al Jazeera. Then, casualties of war. We'll look at how fighting on the Philippines island of Mindanao is taking a toll on a place that's known for its arts and culture. And driverless cars are facing a roadblock in the US. We'll tell you why. Hello there, we've got two storms with us in Asia at the moment and they're both showing up very clearly on the satellite picture. The first one, well this is the most intense one and it's gradually going to run its way towards the northwest and then buckle back round and head away towards the east. It will give us a glancing blow therefore to the eastern parts of China and here we will see torrentially heavy downpours. The other system, well that's in the southern parts of our map, gradually that's working its way towards the west. It's already given us a lot of flooding in the Philippines. Now it's edging its way towards Vietnam. But both of these systems are moving fairly slowly. So if I run through the charts over the next few days, you can see the rain gradually increasing for us in Vietnam and the rain also increasing for us along that east coast of China as well. If we head across towards India, it's in the central belt. We've got most of the wet weather currently. You can see plenty of cloud on the satellite picture at the moment. There'll be plenty more rain as we head through the next few days as well. So some, again, will be very heavy. But also we've got a system developing just to the southwest, and that will ensure that western coast does see a fair amount of heavy rain over the next few days. To the northwest of all of that, though, it's fine and settled for most of us here, Karachi, at around 33 degrees. Here in Doha, the winds will be picking up over the next few days, but still from the east, so it's still going to stay humid. I just want to make sure all of our audience is on the same page. Whether online. What pollutes the US citizens here and what pollutes people of Iraq are one and the same. Or if you join us on set. I was never put aside or been looked at differently because I'm darker than all the people that I'm around. This is a dialogue. Tweet us with hashtag AJStream and one of your pitches might make the next show. Join the global conversation at this time on Al Jazeera.
Hello again, the top stories here on Al Jazeera. Myanmar's leader Aung San Suu Kyi has cancelled plans to attend the UN General Assembly later this month. She's been criticised for failing to condemn violence against Muslim Rohingya in Rakhine State. The President of the EU Commission used his annual State of the Union address to call for a more united Europe after a bruising couple of years. He also wants migrants who don't warrant refugee protection to be sent back to their homes. At a meeting of the Arab League in Cairo descended into a shouting match. Ministers from the four blockading countries and Qatar traded accusations. A Qatari diplomat accused some governments of waging a media campaign against Doha. There have been angry scenes outside a courthouse in Tokyo after North Korean students lost a lawsuit against the government's decision to withhold school subsidies. It's the third such case to be heard in Japan, and only one lawsuit in Osaka has been successful. Craig Gleason reports. This is no ordinary school in Japan. It's North Korean. Established a year after the Second World War, 600 Korean students study here. Almost half of them are of North Korean descent. When Japan colonized Joseon more than 70 years ago, the people there migrated to Japan, and some were forced to move and do excruciating work at coal mines and installing railways. High school tuition fees here cost around $320 a month for each student. While North Korea distributes money to help offset these fees, it leaves a shortfall. In 2010, Japan's Democratic Party began a tuition subsidy scheme. But in that same year, North Korea launched an artillery attack on a South Korean island, and the application process for Korean schools in Japan was temporarily suspended. Two years later, the government of Shinzo Abe placed a total ban on North Korean schools receiving the subsidies. That led 62 former students of a pro Pyongyang school to sue the Japanese government. But the Tokyo District Court has ruled against the students. I am outraged and sad. It was an unforgivable ruling that was made because of political pressure and it encourages discrimination. The children's right to education should be guaranteed. That's why this ruling is unjust. And bringing in diplomacy altogether made this ruling unfair. The government told the court it excluded the North Korean schools from the tuition waiver scheme because of the school's close relationships with North Korea and because the schools couldn't provide enough evidence that they were being operated correctly, a view ultimately supported by the Tokyo District Court. Many blamed the recent crisis for the judgment, but the Japanese we spoke to support subsidies for the North Koreans. If ethnic Korean residents in Japan are going to live in Japan for their lifetime, I think the government should guarantee or support their educational fees. But if they're going back to North Korea, or if their nationality is North Korean, I don't think Japan needs to do it. Lawsuits have been filed in five courts across Japan. In July, a court in Hiroshima ruled for the government. But two weeks later in Osaka, the students won. Two cases are still to be heard. The students in Tokyo say they will launch an appeal against the ruling. Craig Leeson, Al Jazeera, Tokyo. Singapore has named its first female president, but the public didn't get a vote on the matter. Halima Yaakob is a, a former Speaker of Parliament from the Malay minority. Singaporeans were supposed to go to the polls next week, but Yaakob was the only candidate who qualified in the race. For the first time, the constitution was changed to ensure that only a candidate from the Malay minority was eligible to become president. The Philippine army continues to fight an ISIL-linked group which had besieged the city of Marawi on the southern island of Mindanao, where martial law was imposed in May. From there, Jamal Alandogan takes a look at the economic impact of the conflict. Kasan Alawi Saud says these are the worst of times. He's been a wood carver all his life. Pieces like this one take at least six months to make. In the past, he was easily able to sell his carvings. Not anymore. It is not easy. My children don't know how to make this, and there are very few of us left in Tugaya who can do it. Few of us make it, and nobody buys them. The city of Marawi, less than an hour by road from here, remains under siege. The Philippine army continues to battle it out against a local armed group called the Maute. 
fighters inspired by ISIL who are battling to set up an Islamic State in the southern Philippines. More than 300 Filipinos have been killed and at least 200,000 have been forced from their homes. Marawi isn't the only place on the island of Mindanao being affected by the conflict. Tugaya is a town long synonymous with Maranao art. Named after a tree that can only be found here, Tugaya is in the northern part of Lanao del Sur province. UNESCO recognized Tugaya as the home for culture and heritage in Mindanao. The people of Tugaya are also suffering. More than 90% of the villagers here are dependent on trading in Marawi for their livelihood. And since the siege began, they have lost their income and they're now entirely dependent on aid. The mayor of Tugaya says President Rodrigo Duterte's imposition of martial law is making life even more difficult. We do feel the impact of the crisis in Marawi. The poorest of us, the simple merchants, the wood curvers, we suffer. So many workshops like this one are empty. Orders have stopped. This mosque was designed and built by villagers in the 1950s. It's a symbol of what's known here as Ukir motif, an art depicting the identity of Maranaos. They say their home may be safe from the bombs that continue to fall on Marawi, but they remain worried. The fighting doesn't only obliterate buildings. It can also erase the identity of a people. Chumela Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Tugaya, Lano del Sur, Southern Philippines. Three men from Qatar have accused 10 officials from the UAE of torturing and illegally imprisoning them. Their UK-based lawyer has given London's Metropolitan Police details of the allegations. Under British law, UK police can investigate and arrest foreign nationals entering the country if they're suspected of war crimes, torture or hostage-taking anywhere in the world. We spoke to the lawyer, Rodney Dixon, who says the men confessed to their alleged crimes after being tortured. They make very clear that they only made those confessions after they'd been tortured. Uh, they'd been beaten, they were hung upside down, uh, electrocuted, and then they were promised that if they made these confessions uh, that were scripted uh, for them, in which they had to read out in front of a camera, they would be released. Now, of course, they weren't released thereafter. Those confessions were, in fact, used against them, uh, and, and two of them were convicted. Uh, and it's as a result of the fact that those were then made public uh, that they wanted to make it absolutely clear that they were not given of their own free will. They were tortured out of them. The confessions concerned them having to admit to being spies and being enemies of the UAE and looking to take steps to undermine security there. Uh, and they were used in documentaries in the UAE to try and justify the actions that were then being taken in June of this year against Qatar, and uh, which continue now. The islands of the Caribbean took the brunt of Hurricane Irma's fury. On the island of Barbuda, the government estimates that 95% of buildings are damaged. Al Jazeera's John Holman is there. Roger has arrived back home. The small Caribbean island of Barbuda, devastated by Hurricane Irma. He's heading to his house to find out if it survived. There's nothing. There's nothing, you know, all this place that I know is gone. Well, my heart is like, you know. With a population of 1,600, everyone seems to know each other here. It makes the scars of destruction we see as we pass even more painful for Roger. You know, it's kind of hard to see all this. Up there is my friend's house too. All that has been mandled. I didn't really think about this seen it make me feel like it's not working. Homes sheared open like dolls' houses. Inside, the remnants of lives interrupted. A stopped, waterlogged watch. Clothes and toys tossed around. Dishes still waiting to be put away. There's no knowing when those lives will be resumed. Everyone's been evacuated to nearby Antigua until further notice. There's worries about diseases from the stagnant flood water. Roger's only allowed to visit at all because he works on the ferry between the two islands. Right now, the only permanent residents are the animals left behind. 
it's not just people's homes that are gone, it's also their livelihoods. So many Barbudans are fishermen and their badly damaged boats are strewn across the coast. Even when people come back, the government says it will take months of work and more than $200 million to repair buildings and restore electricity and phone lines. It's counting on international aid. Meanwhile, Barbudans wait in shelters and relatives' homes in Antigua. The mood is cheerful, stoic, but impatient to return. As soon as these people from Barbuda get back here, help one another to rebuild Barbuda. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to put my part in it. After seeing his devastated hometown, we arrive at Roger's house and find it's one of the few still intact. It's a small piece of good news on this small, struggling island. John Holman, Al Jazeera, Barbuda. Attacks by the armed group Boko Haram left a trail of destruction throughout the northeast of Nigeria. In Adamawa State, fighters were forced out by the army three years ago. Now, with government control restored, families are beginning to return home, only to find their villages and towns destroyed. Al Jazeera's Catherine Soy reports now on how people are trying to rebuild their lives. The ruined town of Michika is a reminder of when Boko Haram controlled this area for several months around two years ago. Churches were destroyed, so were banks. Entire neighborhoods were reduced to rubble either by Boko Haram or government airstrikes. Government offices that were in this compound are just beginning to be rebuilt. Nigerians who had fled are coming back and the town is starting to thrive again. After the town was taken back by the government, we returned but found nothing. We had lost so much, but now some of us are getting back on our feet. Fadi Yunusa and her seven children returned two months ago. This is what remains of the home she shared with her husband, who she says was killed by Boko Haram. Her neighbors helped her resettle in a new home. We had nowhere to stay, so neighbors hosted us for a while. Then they contributed money to help my family and I. Many people who were displaced from towns and villages in Adamawa state are eager to get on with their lives. But several thousand who remain in camps in the state capital, Yola, aren't so sure. This is one of the few remaining camps in Adamawa state. The Nigerian military has taken back most of the areas that were controlled by Boko Haram a few years back. And now the government wants people to go back home. But those here say their villages are still unsafe. Most of those areas are in neighboring Borno state and are surrounded by Boko Haram in the fight for an Islamic state. The displaced receive help from non-profit organizations such as the Civil Society Coalition for Poverty Eradication. One of the things we are also advocating to government at all levels, both at state and at the national level, is to see these IDPs first as citizens of this country. Regardless of whether they are IDPs or indigents of this country, I mean, or whatever status they find themselves, first and foremost they are Nigerians. And that gives them the rights and privilege to dwell in any location wherever they choose to stay in this country. The government says the bill to repair the war damage in the northeast is $9 billion. Fadi is confident that she will soon rebuild her home and her life. But some scars, such as the killing of her husband. Our goal at the Department of Transportation is to help usher in this new era of transportation, innovation and safety, ensuring that our country remains a global leader in autonomous technology. The new guidelines are scaled back from the ones the Obama administration announced last year. They're also at odds with recommendations the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration rolled out on the same day. It wants a more active role in regulating driverless vehicles by making car companies install more safeguards. The agency made the recommendation after finding that an inattentive driver's over-reliance on an automated system contributed to a fatal crash last year. Self-driving cars are an evolving technology, and manufacturers are racing to mass-produce them.